Hello, my name is Dr. Chan. I'm in the Dean of Admissions here at the University of Utah School of Medicine. Today I just want to talk about why I chose my field. I get asked this question a fair amount and I figured, hey, let's just talk about it, all right? So uh, just part of my journey leading up to this point might explain where I'm coming from. Um, I grew up in Salt Lake City. I went to undergrad out in California. I went to Stanford. I was really involved in college. I was an RA and an RA, you know, a resident assistant, a research assistant. I t was a tour guide. I volunteered at the local hospital, museum volunteer. I tutored and mentored youth from East Palo Alto. I did a bunch of student government stuff. And during this time, I was mostly pre-law. Um, I took a lot of political science classes. Uh, I was on the debate team back here in Salt Lake City. I went to Skyline. I had a really strong debate program back in the day. I liked arguing with my parents about the injustice of curfew times and things like that. But one of my mentors at Stanford uh, suggested I should shadow an attorney, a lawyer, because uh, if I thought that was my path, I should learn more about it. I did it, didn't like it. They really tried to actively talk me out of going to law school. So my mentor said, hey, if you like, uh, you know, if you like helping people, because I mentioned that, you should really you know, shadow doctors, because that's what they do. So I shadowed a bunch of physicians, loved it, very different. And so I switched from pre-law to pre-med while I was at Stanford. And then uh, during my last year at Stanford, I applied to many, many different medical schools. Now, during this time, I maintained my Utah residency, which is key. Uh, and I faced the decision, you know, got into different schools, got into Utah. Do I come back to medical school here at the U? And it was a hard choice, but an easy choice. And in the end, it was the best choice. I decided to come back here. So I came back here to medical school. And as you saw during my kind of undergrad days, I did some stuff with youth. You know, I mentored and tutored youth in East Palo Alto. Um, I just thought I was going to be a pediatrician. People told me growing up I had a pediatrician personality. So all throughout med school, uh, peds, 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 you know, during the first two years. However, during third year, it was like this aha eureka moment. I did a pediatrics rotation, and I just didn't like it as much as I thought I would. Um, why? Babies. I like babies. I like playing with them. I didn't like examining them. No matter what you did, you know, put a stethoscope against their chest, they cry. They couldn't tell me what was wrong. However, I did like some of the young kids and teenagers that rotated through the service, so I thought that was what pediatrics was more going to be like. So I mentioned this to another mentor I had. It's always good to have mentors, and that's a strong advice I have for you out there. Get mentors. Uh, one of my mentors said, hey, if you like talking to young kids and teenagers, you should do a rotation in child and adolescent psychiatry. I wasn't even aware this existed, so I loved it, and the rest is history. All right? So I switched from pediatrics to being a child and adolescent psychiatrist. So I just want to talk about what, what this is. Because again, like you may not know, realize, you know, what this field is like. So this is a physician who specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of disorders of thinking, feeling, and or behavior affecting kids, adolescents, and their families. And I took this right from the ACAP website. So let's break it down. So I usually see patients who are 4 through 17, okay? That's kind of our bread and butter. That's our sweet spot. There's a lot of exceptions to this, we've noticed. There's more and more uh, a growth of something called infant psychiatry. So we've noticed that uh, sometimes uh, when children uh, are born, they have behavioral problems right away. And there might be a genetic reason for this. Or m unfortunately, perhaps there was abuse. Mother may have done you know, cocaine or heroin when she was pregnant with the baby. Uh, unfortunately, you know, one of the sad realities of being a child psychiatrist, we see a lot of children who have been neg neglected or abandoned, uh, who have been abused. And so infant psychiatry is taking off uh, and you know, treating kids younger and younger with the hopes of changing the trajectory. Having said that, there are certain developmental disorders that are better served by a child and psychiatrist. So if you're 25 years old, for example, and you've been diagnosed with autism, so even though chronologically you're 25, but developmentally you're more like 15, would it be better to see a child and adolescent psychiatrist? And the vast majority of people say yes. All right. So even though we see most of our patients between 4 and 17, there are exceptions to that. All right, what types and conditions, disorders, diagnoses, everything. Uh, so we kind of, you know, I just broke this down, just a quick talk about it. So, you know, mood disorders, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar, reactive attachment disorder, anxiety, social anxiety, panic attacks, psychosis, uh, pre-schizophrenia. Uh, technically, you can't get diagnosed with schizophrenia until you're 18, so we call it pre-schizophrenia. Personality disorders, uh, borderline, antisocial. Developmental delays, so autism, fetal alcohol syndrome, mental retardation, comorbid medical condition. So comorbid means like combined with, all right? So you could be diagnosed with depression as well as an eating disorder or anxiety as well as a brain tumor, okay? And then substance abuse, cannabis, alcohol, nicotine, caffeine. 
So as a child and psychiatrist, I see kids and teenagers with diagnoses in all these different areas. And I can easily talk about them more, and maybe in a future lecture series I'll do this. But that's kind of like you know, what we see day in, day out. So settings. So I currently work as an inpatient hospitalist at the University Neuropsychiatric Institute, or UNI. What does it mean to be a hospitalist? I only see people when they're admitted, okay? So I don't actually have an outpatient clinic. So how does someone get admitted to a psychiatric facility? When someone has a suicide attempt, they're sent over, like, you know, suicide attempt happens at home, sent to the ER at primary children's, they get medically stabilized, they transfer them to uni to make sure they're psychiatric stabilized. Someone, uh, you know, runs away from school and gets into a really bad fight and threatens to kill people or themselves. Someone who has a really bad eating disorder and they faint because they're eating less and less and their vital signs are unstable, they'll get admitted to uni. Uh, someone who, you know, either intentionally or unintentionally overdoses on, you know, opiates or marijuana or alcohol, they'll get sent to uni. So we kind of see all these different, you know, kids from different settings within the inpatient setting. So kids stay on average from, you know, a week to two weeks. I don't have an outpatient clinic, so when people approach me and say, hey, can you treat and see my child as an outpatient basis? I, I don't have a clinic, so sorry. And then I don't just make my life easier in many ways. I don't allow pre-medical students to shadow me. All right. But people are interested, feel free to email the departments, and they have a system set up where they kind of triage people who are interested in shadowing opportunities. We have a rotation system at uni, which I absolutely love, four weeks on, two weeks off. So what that means is um, I work as an inpatient hospitalist for four weeks, and then I get two weeks off. It's fantastic. I get paid full time to work two-thirds of the year. Um, and I really think it's, it's an awesome, it's a good way to recharge your batteries and get fresh and relax a bit before going back on service. So what are the paths to becoming a child and adolescent psychiatrist? So there's actually two paths. Uh, the first one I did, so I did general psychiatry residency, which can be three to four years, followed by a two-year child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship. So that can be a five to six-year path. Uh, to me, that's the most popular one. But also, there's also something called triple board program, which is five years. You get triple board in three fields, pediatrics, adult psychiatry, and child psychiatry. Um, and it's, it's kind of the same, but you know, obviously, uh, as, a, you know, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist myself, I'm not boarded in pediatrics, okay? And it's, it's great, I love my triple board uh, colleagues. You know, when I have a question about antibiotic or something like that, they're quick to help. Uh, but those are the kind of two paths to become a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this little talk about how I chose my field and hope some of you out there become child lesson psychiatrists one day. All right, thank you.